Hello everyone, thank you all for being here today. My name is Chelsea Romulo and I'm a doctoral student at George Mason University. I'll be talking to you all today about a little bit of my dissertation research uh, that focuses on the harvest of a tropical palm fruit called a guaje. So first I'm going to touch a little bit on the ecology of the species and some background information on the harvest to give you some context. And then I'm going to dive right into what my research is about and what some of my findings are. So guaje is a palm found throughout the Amazon rainforest. And it forms these very dense stands of trees that can be hundreds of hectares in size. The female trees produce very large racines of fruit. And as you can see in this picture, it's almost the size of a full-grown man. And each racine can hold hundreds to thousands of uh, actual fruit. And this fruit provides a really good food source for a lot of animal species, such as these red ricari monkeys. In addition to providing food for many animal species, the fruit is harvested by the hundreds of sacks throughout the Peruvian Amazon. So most of these sacks go to be sold in the city of Iquitos, um, which has about half a million people, slightly smaller than D.C. Uh, and these sacks enter the city by the hundreds every single day. So this fruit sounds pretty great. It's feeding lots of animals and lots of people. Uh, but the problem is, is that most of the fruit is harvested by cutting. And uh, so my first semester in graduate school, I wrote a report on this species for a course on natural resource management. And I couldn't find very much information on exactly how much of this tree was being cut and if anybody was doing anything about it. So I decided to do my dissertation research on this species uh, because of this problem that I saw, which is that aguaje is harvested unsustainably. And because of my background and interests, I decided to look specifically at the market of the fruit. And so my research question, or the research question that I'm presenting to you all today, is what is the market structure for aguaje? And how can we use the information and the knowledge of the market structure to encourage more sustainable harvest? In order to answer this question, I knew I had to talk to people who work with Aguaje directly in Peru. And um, I wanted to talk to everybody along the market chain. So this is a simplified version of the market chain. And there's four main groups. And I'm going to go through each of these groups uh, and talk to you a little bit about what I found from talking to them. I interviewed hundreds of people over the past few years, um, and most of my interviews were semi-structured, although I did do um, a short survey of consumers in markets and plazas. So let's start with the harvester group. This map shows communities that harvest aguaje to be sold in the city of Iquitos. There are hundreds of these communities. But one thing to note is that not all communities harvest at the same rate. That's either total volume or per capita. The dots that are in yellow show you where 90% of aguaje comes from in total. So most of the aguaje comes from very few communities. And part of what I wanted to understand is why most comes from very few places and what other communities might be doing and why they might not be harvesting. So I said, most of Oahe is harvested by cutting. And that means some of it is harvested by climbing. And I wanted to quantify how much was actually harvested by cutting versus climbing. And I found that most communities do cut down the tree. And when I talked to individual harvesters, what I found was um, the harvest method is usually the same method per community. So an entire community will either cut down the tree or an entire community will climb the tree, even though there are individuals working by themselves to do the actual harvest and sell the fruit in markets. When I asked harvesters from communities that cut whether they knew about climbing methods or whether they wanted to climb, they told me, all of them, that they'd heard about climbing. Some of them had even seen other communities and other people climbing trees. Um, and some had even participated in climbing workshops. But they told me, two very important things. One is that they did not have access to climbing materials or training. And the second thing is that there was a very pervasive perception that cutting 
is much faster and much safer than climbing. Um, when I time people and how long it takes to cut and climb the tree, it's about 10 minutes either way. So, um, But most of the people who cut down the tree are convinced that this is much safer and faster. So after uh, harvesting the fruit and placing it into sacks, most of it is sold to intermediaries who buy one to two sacks at a time from harvesters, aggregate them by the hundreds, and then divide them by quality and size to be sold to vendor groups. There are not very many of these intermediaries. So we have hundreds of communities um, with dozens of people in each community harvesting, but there's only maybe 50 people working as these intermediaries, and most of them are related to each other. So there's sisters, brothers, or mother-daughter teams that work as these intermediary sellers. And so they control the bulk of the market. Um, after these intermediaries aggregate the fruit, they then sell it to vendor groups. And with the exception of 10 small ice cream factories, most of these vendors are individuals, and mostly women, um, that buy the fruit and then either sell it whole or process it into a couple different products to be sold to consumers. Uh, this group is very dispersed and um, not organized. And so everybody's working individually, and a lot of them are working part-time. So um, there's a huge group of women who are just working a little bit with the to supplement the income brought in by their husbands. Lastly, I surveyed consumers in markets and plazas throughout the city and um, asked them just a few short questions. When I asked them if they knew how a guaje is harvested, most of them had some idea of it was climbed or it was cut, but 20% of people that I talked to had no idea, and 16% thought all of it was climbed, and that although it used to be cut in the past, nobody was cutting anymore. Then I asked them if they were worried about how a blockade was harvested, and two-thirds of them said yes, that they had some concerns. And these concerns related to conservation of the species, livelihoods of the harvesters, and also quality and sanitation. A lot of people pointed out to me that when you cut down the tree, especially since it lives in a swamp, and it falls down, the fruit ends up in the muck. Whereas people who climb the tree um, can put down a layer of palm fronds so that when the tree, when the fruit falls straight down, uh, it doesn't end up in swampy, dirty water. Um, one other thing to point out about the people who said they were not worried is those were the same people who tended to either not know how a guaje is harvested or the ones who thought all the fruit was climbed. The next thing I asked was whether they would pay more for fruit that had been climbed. And three quarters of people actually said yes. And this kind of surprised me. Um, but a lot of them told me that they would have a hard time trusting a vendor who told them that the fruit was from climbed trees. So whether or not if somebody had a sign saying that the fruit claim came from climbed trees, whether people would actually pay more or preferentially buy that fruit, I don't know. It would be a fun thing to test. <laughs> so. Um, I want to point out a couple things from my findings about the market in general. And the first is market power, which is who has the most control and the most money in the market. And that's obviously the intermediary groups. Um, one thing I didn't mention yet is that from every sack of a wahe that's sold, 10% or less of that money goes to a harvester. Usually about half of it goes to these intermediary groups. And that's not uncommon for these kinds of systems. And so uh, these intermediaries have a lot of control in terms of who they're buying from, where the wahe is coming from, and who they're selling it to, and they have a lot of control in terms of price. Um, they're also very organized. So some of them formed associations, and they use those associations to keep people out or maintain prices. The next thing is uh, market access. So. Um, another graduate student conveniently did her research in my same interest area and um, she was looking at transportation in the Amazon. Uh, most uh, people who sell products in the markets don't have their own large boat to get to the city. And so they rely on these barges that move up and down the river towards Iquitos. And what this researcher found is that there's this imaginary line where as the barges are moving down the river, they become full. 
and then there's no room for more products. And a wahe is a fruit that spoils very quickly. And so everybody past this imaginary line is not able to get their fruit onto the boat uh, reliably to get to the city. And if we put these lines on my graph of harvesting villages, what you see is that most of the largest harvesters are before this line. And so one of the influences of who is harvesting and how much they're harvesting is just basic access to the market through space on barges. So you can see past that imaginary line are the communities that harvest much less. Um, one of the main, or three of the main points I want to make here is that there are some barriers to sustainable harvest. Um, the first being basic access to climbing equipment and training. The second one is incentives to climb and purchase sustainably harvested fruit. So when I talk to, for example, the intermediary sellers, um, they're very interested in having the fruit climbed so that they have insured future income, but most of them are not interested in paying a premium for that fruit or doing anything to um, encourage harvester communities to climb. The last thing is reliable market access. So transportation is a huge issue for communities. And I've talked to communities who actually stopped harvesting because the barge no longer stopped at their community because of river dynamics. But I would like to finish with um, that these are not necessarily barriers, but they can be opportunities. There's eight NGO groups teaching climbing workshops in the area. And um, there is a big Peruvian marketing campaign with commercials about the importance of the guaje and um, how, what we need to do in order to preserve the species. Lastly, I've met with businesses who actually have contacts with communities that climb, and they want to specifically set a standard price with them and support those communities. So in conclusion, I'd just like to point out that the market is a very important aspect we need to consider when we're thinking about targeting conservation interventions for those species. And I'd like to thank my funding agencies and advisory committee